Hi, my name is Scott Reed. I'm the chair of the math department at Lakeland High School, but I've also been teaching test prep for students seeking to be admitted to colleges for about 15 years. Today we're going to look at the new tests and new formats of the test to help you better prepare for your SAT or your ACT. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. The first test that we're going to look at is the ACT. All right, there are two college admission tests, the ACT and the SAT. The ACT has been around a long time and it's gone through the least change lately. Let's look at what we have here in terms of the content and format of the, of the ACT. What you see is that you start and it's always in the same order. You have what we call an English section. That's a multiple choice writing where you are fixing sentences, arranging grammar, putting in new words, putting in new sentences rearranging paragraphs, those kinds of things, working with idioms and usage and structure and logic. All right, next comes the math section. It's one hour, 60 questions. You have a calculator, but you don't have a formula sheet. Okay? And it's the only section on the ACT in which you have a calculator. After that, you take a break. You have your third section, which is the reading section. Again, very consistent. Four passages. Each passage has 10 questions and they cover the same content areas all the time. Literary fiction, humanities, natural sciences, social sciences. Four passages, 10 questions each, 40 questions, but you only have 35 minutes. And then you go to the science section, and this is what's unique to the ACT is the science section. Right? But I want you to get right from the outset, you've got to get it out of your mind that you have to be a scientist to take the ACT. All you're doing is reading again, just like you read that that natural science passage or that humanities passage in the preceding section, you're just reading different information. Some charts, some uh, graphs, some data tables, some understandings about a theory or an experiment. That's the reading. And then finally at the ACT, the last thing you do is the optional essay if you choose to do that. I strongly encourage every student to take to write an essay at least once for each test. A lot of schools have had essays for a long time, although they're optional now, certainly our competitive colleges are going to be looking at that, at that essay. Your ability to take an unseen prompt and, and, and take a position on it, identify and analyze the, the argument structures in that prompt, and then to write and articulate that clearly using the Queen's English. Okay, So that's the, the ACT. And you can see what we're, you're getting is a variety of scores that will show you what you have, right? No changes to the scoring. Each, each section has a score of 1 to 36, and that's for each of the four, the, the English, the math, the reading, and the science. And then you get a composite score. And they take the four scores, and it's real hard to figure out, they take the four scores and they add them up and divide by four, right? Now you're also getting some new subscores here, and this is brand new, and the schools will be getting this, the colleges and universities to which you send your scores, you'll get something that gives a separate English and language arts. That's the ELA here, right? Your ability in English and language art. In reading STEM type information, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Also looking at career readiness and text complexity. How do you handle, as the text gets more complex, how, do you, how does your skill set respond? How are you performing in those, those things? In the math and the reading, you get a little more problem stats on the, on the ACT. And they also have gone like what the SAT has done. As you'll see as we continue through this presentation, these tests are really kind of mirroring up to each other. And you have paired passages now in the, in the reading on the ACT. Okay. The essay. The essays on both tests used to be short little prompts where you took, you were presented with an issue and two sides and you took a side and defended it, right? It could be whether uh, elementary schools should have uniforms for children, something like that, very pragmatic. Now it's much more complex. You're given a much more complex issue. In the ACT, you're given three perspectives on that issue and you have to analyze the three and then adopt one or craft your own out of those three or independently of that and then articulate that uh, persuasively in a good, well-written, logical essay. And so it, it, they score you in a variety of, of means, your, how you develop your ideas and analyze the prompt, how it is you organize your information and develop your support, what evidence do you use to support your, your position, and then lastly that usage of the, of, the, of the correct usage and appropriate usage of language and grammar that they look for. This ability to communicate in writing is critical to your success in college. 
All right, now let's look at the new SAT. This is a radical change in this test. It used to be 10 sections, some 25 minutes, some 20 minutes, one 10 minutes. Now they've totally revamped it into four solid sections. Like the ACT, it's going to go in order every time, a different order, but in order every time. And they've gone back to the old 1600 scoring, right? 800 in what we call now language and reading, right? The, the evidence-based reading and writing. And then you have another 800 points in your math. And like the ACT, the essay is optional. This essay on the SAT has gone from 25 minutes to 50 minutes. And instead of taking a little prompt and, and writing an essay about it, you're taking 50 minutes to read a long passage, 600, 700 words, analyze how that author's used rhetorical skills and language and evidence to support his or her position, and then write about that in your own essay. The test now is three hours, and if you take the essay, it's an additional 50 minutes. What happens on test day is everybody who's not taking the essay leaves after the end of the three hours, and you stay and do your essays with the group of students that are doing, doing that. And again, it's optional, but strongly encouraged that you consider taking the essay at least once. Okay? The scoring, we've gone back again from the, to the 800 scale to 800s, which is a total of 1600. You turn it in blank, you just sign your name and turn it in blank, you get 200 on each section. That's a 400, but that, that's not a score you want, right? And so they are going to separately score the essay. So let's get a little deeper in how they're going to be scoring the, uh, the new SAT. What you get is those, the big composite scores, that range of 400 to 1600, right, on the two big sections. And then you get some subscores on math and reading and writing and language arts, right? How you handle science passages versus history and social studies passages. That's going to be a subscore that goes to your schools. And those also have some, some ranges there. Not quite sure how schools are going to be handling that. It's brand new, right? The first, the first college admissions people that are really using this new SAT just got to work last fall. And so we don't know yet what that's going to mean in terms of your application, your placement, how they will look at, at your overall scoring. What do we mean by evidence-based reading and writing? Okay, well, it means that you're going to have passages. You have five. The first one will always be literary fiction. It's some snippet of a novel or a short story from anywhere in the world. Could be U.S. literature, could be anywhere in the world. Then you have two social studies or social science passages. And you have, then you have two science passages. This is a 65-minute question for these five, 65-minute uh, section for these five passages. And you are uh, a wide variety of topics. Some of these, of these passages will be what we call historical or authentic documents, right? You might get a speech by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you might get a, um, uh, a, a, a treaty or some, some discussion about a treaty from World War I, right? A lot of historical documents, things you might be studying and seeing, certainly maybe in your AP literature courses or your honors uh, government and history courses. A lot more college readiness, a lot more rigor now in this test. Uh, for your ability to, to be successful in college. And that's what this is all about. None of these tests here are to punish you. You're rewarded on these tests based on your preparation and your abilities and knowing how to take a test. And that's why you're looking at this, at this today. This is all about getting ready for this test. It's a lip, not like all your academic classes. It's a little different approach when we're confronting a standardized test like this. Okay. Some of the other details on a reading, pretty long passages. You got to be moving, 65 minutes. In the writing and language, what you get there is a series of passages and some word or phrase or part of a sentence or a whole sentence will be underlined. And you have to see whether it's broken or not. Is there something erroneous in the way that it's written? And which is the best way to fix it? Okay, Which is the best way to fix it? So there's 35 minutes. And what the SAT is generally doing now is giving you that first full hour, 65 minutes, then a break, then come back and do the 35-minute writing and a 25-minute math section, get another short break, and then finish up with 55 minutes of math, as we'll see here. Okay? On the math, big shift here, right? Used to be a lot of geometry on the SAT, right? And they used to, and they give you a formula sheet. They still give you the same formula sheet. It's all geometry on the formula sheet, but you don't get a whole lot of geometry anymore. A lot of algebra. A lot of algebra one, in fact. But it's not just equations, it's applications, right? What we call the heart of algebra, the real world algebra. Looking at relationships that can be determined by a data table or um, a representation of a graph or a scatter plot. 
Um, and being able to make predictions about that, determine equations about that, using that information and applying the algebra, a lot of word problems, a lot of word problems. And then the passport to advanced math is that being able to couple those skills, make and do multi-steps, right? Get an answer here, use that answer in the next problem. And being able to, to continue that and be consistent and, and apply good, good problem solving skills to get that done. The, the student constructed response, what you have here is what we call grid ins. I'm sure you've heard of those. It's like some of the, the TEI questions on our SOLs where you have to supply your own answer. And so they have spaces where you can do that. There's no answer choices for you to kind of back into or use to your advantage. And so you need to be ready to, to do that kind of math. It's a total of 80 minutes. 25 minutes of that is non-calculator. You might have seen that on the PSAT, right? That came out in uh, October of 2015 was the first time we saw that. Non-calculator, and then after the 25 minute section, you have 55 minutes with a calculator. Now, what are you thinking in terms of this change and, and, and what, what it means to you? Um, let's, let's dig a little deeper in terms of how we might, might uh, approach it. You've gotta, be, you've gotta be thinking about pacing, right? That's constantly gotta be on your mind is the idea of timing. Okay? It's not like the SOL, you have all day long to take that test. It's not like probably a lot of your teachers that give you extended time or allow you to come back. This test, when that clock rings, when 25 minutes is done on that, on that math section, 25 minutes is done. And so you've, the, the way to approach it and the way to even start thinking about your practice is what we call efficiency. Now, what, let's think about this. If, if all I'm worried about is finishing, what am I going? Zoom, 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 zoom. What happens to my accuracy? It plummets, right? I don't get much right. If all I'm worried about getting it right, I only get to half the questions, you see? You leave a lot on the table. One big change in the SAT now is there's no wrong answer penalty. That means that you're not, used to be that they, if you got it wrong, they take a quarter point off. It was, they were trying to help you to avoid guessing is what they were doing. Now there's, there's no wrong answer penalty. You gotta get everything bubbled in. But, but what, you've got to what you've got to remember is you want to maximize your exposure to questions you can answer, right? If you don't give yourself the time to get to those questions, you're leaving a lot of points on the table. And so your approach has to be to be able to move with what we call efficiency, accuracy with pacing, understanding and practicing and becoming familiar with this test in such a way that when you walk into that test day on a Saturday morning, you know exactly what's gonna happen. You know where your points are and you go find them and you get them. And you build that bucket of points to maximize your score for the colleges that you want to go to, okay? One final point before we dig into some strategies here, the SAT essay. Like I said, it's radically changed. Gone from 25 minutes to 50 minutes. You're reading a huge passage and you're asked, not your opinion. Nobody cares about your opinion about what you read on this, on this particular essay. You stay out of it. What you're doing is you're like a surgeon with a scalpel in your hands. Okay, you're cutting apart this passage. What kind of techniques did the author use? What kind of evidence did the author use to support his or her position? Right? How persuasive is it? And then you, you analyze that and objectively write about that in terms of whether that author did a good job or a poor job. And that's what you're going to, that's what you'll be scored on. And again, you'll be looking at your ability to read, pretty complex passage sometime, analyze the information, connect the dots, and then your writing skills. Again, that, that written communication skill. Um, and that's why I think taking the essays is so important. It's such a critical skill in colleges and they look for it. They want to see, do you have the ability to communicate in writing uh, and, and with your ideas, uh, with your analysis, with your evidence and examples? Okay, but we'll see here. Done away with a lot of the, the old stuff, a lot of the geometry's gone, a little bit of trig, a lot more algebra. And we're looking not so much on vocabulary anymore, but on, on, the, on the, uh, the, the rhetorical skills that we have in our writing. All right, five big differences here. Let's look at number one. We have greater focus on history and social study passages, like some of those authentic or original passages as well, right? Not just willy-nilly essays anymore. A uh, lot of algebra. Uh, and the new SAT data analysis, right? Interpreting data and, and getting linear equations out of it or other types of equations and seeing what it is. Can I predict and use those, right? Some of those terms you might have heard in your algebra classes like regression, right? Linear regression, finding that equation that best fits the data. The ACT has the science reading, a little more mental math because I don't have a calculator for part of my math, 
right? See, I'm real fortunate. I grew up without a calculator. And they, believe me or not, you, you can do a lot of this math without the calculator. Sometimes all they're asking you to do is to find an equation, not even to calculate anything with the equation, just find the equation, all right? A lot of mental math, a lot of critical thinking and using math for that, for that subject of your critical thinking. And then the grid ends and the extended thinking grid ends, right? What I mean by extended thinking, I got to answer this problem, I got to get it right, and I got to use that right answer and go to the next problem. You see, there's a little bit of pressure. Yeah, I got to be consistent, I got to be careful, I got to be accurate, I got to know what I'm looking for. As you contemplate, you know, which test am I going to take, when am I going to take it, when, you know, I recommend both. I've had students over my years, um, you know, say they got waitlisted at Virginia Tech on an ACT score, they took the SAT and got in, or vice versa, right? So it's just, sometimes it's a very subjective thing. You might be more comfortable with one test or the other. You might perform better with one format of a test than the other. You won't know that until you do that, until you take those tests. And so I would get into my schedule and plan out, you know, when am I going to take my ACT? When am I going to take my SAT? Project out, give yourself, you know, somewhere 60 to 90 days to prepare. Uh, I'm being serious about that, that preparation. You know, one reason that I do what I do with these tests is they're predictable as the sun coming up tomorrow. But I don't know how to attack that test unless I practice it, unless I put problems in front of my face, unless I have strategies and, and strong strategies to address every each type of problem in there. And so that's what you've got to commit to if you want to be serious about your college applications and serious about beating out all the other students that want to get your seat at the college that you want to go to. Right? That's what it's about. These are very competitive days. Um, in, in our competitive schools, and you want to put your best foot forward, right? All right, well, let's look at uh, ACT science. Let's start there, because that's generally the one that people, they stare away from the ACT because it has a science section. But as we see here, it's pretty, pretty manageable. Um, again, my emphasis is that you are not you know, undertaking scientific investigation. You're not memorizing periodic tables. You're not looking at what happens when certain electrons match up with certain protons. What you're looking at is reading information uh, just like you might, you might just have read a passage about uh, you know, the, the blue whale and its migration habits. That's in your reading passages in the reading section. You go to the science section and maybe somebody's done an experiment about that and you read about the experiment, that's all. A different representation of n information by which you can elicit facts and get the details. You can also make deductions about what must be true about those facts. And it comes down basically just understanding the purpose, method, and results of science, right? Being able to identify that in the passage. So you have three different passage types. You've got these data representations where they're just making observations, either out in the field, out in the woods, in the lab, something like that. You've got research summaries where they are after something, right? They are trying to figure out something. So they do a series of experiments and they summarize those for you, what they controlled and what they changed and what the, re the outcomes were. And then you'll always have what we call the competing hypotheses, the competing theories or conflicting viewpoints passages. You've got two scientists, two teachers, two students who over the same phenomena are arguing about a theory about that phenomena. And so they you, that's where you put together your inferential skills, right? What kind of evidence supports one theory or the other? How does one scientist or proponent of one theory respond to the evidence of the other, right? That kind of cross match, which you'll see the same thing in the paired passages in your reading as well, okay? Now, what you gotta do is supply scientific reasoning, right? Understand and be able to identify purpose, method, and results, and look for the questions, the big global questions, detail questions, function questions, inference questions, things that just ask you about the information that's there. So let's, let's look at a, uh, a passage here, or look at a method that we have to, to do this, okay? And this is a, a proven method to be able to attack that, to take the pressure off you, and to understand how to, how to manage this information, okay? You're going to do what we call map the passage. Um, we're gonna, when we get to reading, we're going to do the same thing. What we mean by that is getting to the why and how, not so much the what. I mean, you've got to understand the facts. But you're not taking either of these tests in order to learn something new, are you? I mean, if you learn something new while you're taking one of these tests, the time to get excited about that is later that afternoon when you're excited about being over. You're celebrating it being over and say, guess what I learned today? Not doing the test. Here it's all about getting to that purpose and structure, right? Really digging down in the information, using the information to your advantage to get points. That's what it's all about, okay? So we're going to map the passage and identify 
and, and, and mark the purpose, the method, and results of any experiments. What is it they're doing? What are they observing? What are they creating in terms of their experiments? What kind of setting or environment are they doing that? We look at the data, get you know, the, the, the legends of our, of our data graphs. You know, what's the horizontal? What's the vertical? What do they represent? What are the units of measurement? All right, simple things. I'll scan the figures and identify all those things, and then everything that I need to answer the question, like any part of this test, is in the passage, whether that's in the regular reading or in the science. The information is there. I don't have, need any outside knowledge uh, to answer those questions and to get those points. See, that ought to be a confidence builder, that you're not having to cram for this. This is not like studying all night for a test in chemistry at your high school. This is going to take a test that you're going to take this information and use the critical thinking skills that I use every day to be able to get points on the, on the test. Okay. So let's look at what we got here. Here's a, just a brief snippet right, of, a, of a passage. I'm going to give you, it's passage four, that's all the Roman numeral is up there. And it can be given us an experience, right? The, the um, process has been developed by which plastic bottles can be recycled in a clear, colorless material. This material, called new PVC, can be used to form park benches and other similar structures. A series of experiments was performed to determine the weathering abilities of new PVC. <coughs> all right? So let's think about what we, what we know from that first, we haven't even gone to an experiment. What do we know so far? Well, you might read they've got this new material, new PVC, but they've also already told us the purpose, right? Look at that verb down there, to determine the weathering abilities of new PVC. We already got our purpose. That's what we look for. Then we get down to the first experiment, and that is where we get to the method. The description and the construction of that experiment is what gives us our method, right? 15 boards of new PVC, each 150 by 25 by 8 centimeters in size, were sprayed with distilled water for 10 hours a day for 32 weeks. 10 hours a day for 32 weeks. All 15 boards remained within 0.1 centimeters, 1 tenth centimeters of their original dimensions. The surfaces of the boards displayed no signs of cracking, bubbling, or other degradation, right? There's the method, there's the experiment, right? They took all those boards and put them out there in water, 10 hours a day and 32, 32 weeks, okay? So there's the results, nothing, no sign of degradation, okay? That's what we glean. Let's go to get a question now. Let's, put, let's translate that work, and it wasn't hard reading, right, into a point, okay? Based on the results of experiment one, all right? When I see that word based on, that's an indicator to me, as we'll learn, as, as you practice, that this is a, an inference question. It's not going to be expressly stated in the passage, but it's something that must be true given the information in the passage. And see, that is a fine critical thinking skills. To understand the limits of the information that you have in front of you, whether it's math, whether it's reading, whether it's writing, whether it's science, and to be able to make deductions about that. What must be true versus what only could be true or false versus what must be false. You see the distinction there? And so we're rewarded for making that deduction. If we think about this on this experiment in one, where they just pummeled it in water over and over and over and over and over for weeks on end, and no degradation means what? These things can probably withstand water, right? Let's look at our choices here. Material absorbs water? No. Swell? No, we didn't notice anything. Here's what we call the 180 or the opposite, right? The material will be useful only in areas where there is no acid rain. Where did that come from? Acid rain. The material surface does not appear to require a protective coating to avoid water damage. They didn't coat these, did they? They pummeled them with water over and over again and yet saw no damage. There's my choice, right? H. Let's look at J and see if we can reject that. The material loses flexibility after prolonged, no. No degradation, no loss of flexibility there, okay? So there's our correct choice there. Based on inference question, go find the deduction. What must be true based on the information in the passage, okay? Again, we didn't know, know anything about this material, this new PVC, before coming to take our test. All the information we needed about new PVC was in my passage, okay? In my passage. That's how you attack science, all right? Now, let's go jump over to the SAT and the non-calculator section, right? You know, I've got, I, I teach Algebra 2, I teach Calculus, I teach Geometry. 
you know, if I try to take my calculators away from my students, I risk my life, right? Most students these days have grown up on calculators, feel they need a calculator to do any kind of math. Well, that's not the case. And SAT is proving it every day now that that's not the case. And what they're looking for, well, let me ask you know, a question that comes up all the time. Well, why do they make such changes in this test? Why do they do away with a calculator for part of it, right? Who uses this test? Colleges use this test. Colleges were the ones that demanded that the SAT make this more rigorous. Colleges were the ones that demanded the SAT test the things they needed to know. Right? Can you think without a calculator? Can you make deductions? That's all you're doing in mathematics, what must be true based on a given relationship, right? Same thing in science. And so they took the calculator away for a while and to see how your reasoning skill is. How is it we can represent information, get the relationships, see the patterns, and make deductions there. All right, so let's look at this question here. We're going to a high-tech video arcade, and there's a graph here that shows the amount that they charge the customers. We can glance at it, and we see that it's a line, right? A linear function, right? Constant rate of change with a slope. And we look at the, the units of measurement here is number of games and the cost in dollars. Pretty straightforward. The question is, what's the key word in the question is the ultimate question, what could be could the y-intercept of this graph represent? And so let's look at that y-intercept, right, is where? Over here, right, y-intercept. I haven't played any games. My y-intercept is always in any, any graph is where I'm, x is zero, I haven't started yet. I haven't paid, played any games whatsoever and they're charging me $5. I can get that right off the scale here, right? What do you think that means? Why do you got, you're out $5 and you haven't done anything yet, right? Let's see what it could mean here. Cost of playing five games. No, the cost of find, playing five games is way up here, right? $15, okay? That's, that's a wrong answer choice. The cost per game, no, that would be my, that would help me with my slope, right? Every time I add a game, I add a cost. Add a game, add a cost. Rise over run, right? That wouldn't be that. The entrance fee, hmm. The entrance fee, haven't played any games, and then I gotta post $5 before I can start playing games. That sounds right. Entrance fee, and the number of games that are played, no. That's, we, I choose that. There's my independent variable. I choose that, whether I want two games or six games or eight games. So, see, analysis. Taking a simple algebra one concept, pre-algebra one concept, right, of a constant rate of change, and saying, hey, what is it when, before you start playing the games? What has that got to represent? What's the math there that's, that, it, that is representing that kind, of, that kind of charge? Now, let's get to the heart of algebra, right? A lot of algebra here. If you look at this problem here, maybe you've seen it or maybe you haven't, depending on what math you have. It's an algebra two uh, concept that we teach in, in Suffolk, and it's called rational expressions or rational functions, right? Where you have a polynomial, right? A variable expression divided by another variable expression, okay? So, what's the, what's the problem when I got variables and denominators? If I got variables and denominators, okay, I got the risk of going, that denominator going to zero, right? Let's look at this problem. What happens if, if x is equal to negative five? If x is equal to negative five, negative five plus five, and that first denominator is zero, I'm not allowed to divide by zero. That's undefined, right? Okay. So I gotta watch out for those kinds of things and some things, and, and the SAT will hold me responsible for that, to know that I can't divide by zero. But here they're asking us to divide, right? Which of the following is equivalent to the expression above given that x is not equal to negative five? Now, do you see why they put that in the problem? That's not, that, that x not equal to negative five is not there to scare you, it's there to just kind of make sure everybody's on the same page that we're not asking you to divide by zero. We're gonna find this is gonna be applicable for values that are not zero, any real number besides negative five, okay? So, got a fraction divided by a fraction. Now, this takes us back to like third or fourth grade, right? Uh, what is it we'd have to do when we divide a fraction by a fraction? What's the traditional math way of doing that is hold the first fraction and turn it into a multiplication problem by multiplying by the reciprocal of that second one, okay? 
So let's look at those steps there about what that would do if I did traditional math. And that's for a lot of students, a lot of my students, traditional math is the way they like. They're going to go, they have confidence in it, they got pretty, pretty good uh, pacing with it, pretty good accuracy with it, and they can do it, all right? So what we would do is we would flip the fraction, right? Flip the second fraction in that second step, and then we would come across and multiply. We see that we can factor out a 4 from that new numerator. So instead of 4x plus 20, we have 4 times x plus 5. And then what happens when I have an x plus 5 on top and an x plus 5 on the bottom? It cancels, right? Because x can't be negative 5 means I'm not dividing out 0. You see, that's how they're just covering themselves and helping you. Okay, so they go away, and then what happens in my last step? I cancel those, and we can see that we have 12x over 6, right? 4 times 3x is 12x, and 6 on the bottom, and that gives me 2x. So there's my answer choice A, right? If you've had this math, if you've worked with rational expressions in Algebra 2, and if you remember it on test A, then you got it, traditional math, okay? Let's think about an alternative here, right? As I said earlier, I teach some higher level math courses. I insist on my students showing me process, right? Showing me process. And what I want to see is their thinking and coming down and getting to that answer, right? Well, guess what? On the SAT or the ACT, you are given a test booklet. That's your only scratch paper, right? You write in the booklet, you do all your scratch work there. You turn it in because you can't leave the room with it. You turn it in with your answer sheet. But you know what? Nobody looks at it. Nobody grades it. Nobody, nobody going to give you partial credit because you were almost there in the booklet and you bubbled in the wrong answer. That doesn't happen. Either you got it right or you got it wrong. End of discussion. And so it really doesn't matter how you got there, right? You're not here to show off about how much math you know. And that's almost sacrilege for a math teacher, right? But you're here to say what? How do I get this point? This is supposed to work for every number that I know about except negative 5, right? That's what they told me in the problem. Well, let's pick an easy, easy number to work with and see what we get. Put it in the problem, see what we get. So I'm going to say, how about let's pick the number 1. Let's say x is equal to number 1. Let's put it in the problem and see what our answer is. Put in 1. 3 times 1 is 3 over 6 divided by 6 over 24. You see how that comes out? It comes out to 2, right? So when x is equal to 1, the answer is 2. Now look at answer choice A. When x is equal to 1, I get 2. Answer choice A, the very same answer I got through all that hard math is the same answer I get from picking numbers. So that's an excellent strategy when I have all variables in my answer choices. Other instances might be, to pick numbers when I have unknown quantities in my question, right? They give me, say, I've increased my speed by 20%, but they don't tell me what I started with. Well, what are percents based on? 100. So I don't care what the problem is. My starting speed's 100. The starting price of that new car is 100. That, that I just move it up and down with percentages using that number, x equals 100, as that starting quantity, okay? And so we can pick numbers, and again, as it says there on the screen, Permissible and manageable. Permissible, it's got to fit the problem, right? If it says it's going to be a positive integer, I can't use negative 2. It's got to be a positive integer. Manageable, keep it as small as possible. Now, let me, one cautionary note, right? I used 1 in this problem because I was using 1 in a variety of places. But if I had just one place I was putting that x in, I probably would stay away from 1. Why do you think that is? Why would you stay away from 1? What happens? What happens when you multiply anything by 1? Nothing, right? What happens when you divide anything by 1? Nothing. What happens when you put a huge exponent on 1? Nothing, right? You see, you're looking for change. We wanted to see change. And so when you have multiple steps, like I did here, one can work out all, all right. But most times, I'm starting with 2 and 3. If I need some numbers and some variables, starting with 2 and, and 3, OK? Another technique that you ought to put in mind, and we don't have a, I don't have a problem here for that, but it's what we call back solving. And I'm sure you've used this on the SOLs in Algebra 1 or Geometry or, or Algebra 2, where you have a series of numerical answer choices, right? 2, 7, 15, 21. You know the right answer staring you in the face, right? One of those four has got to work. And you just back it into the problem, 
all right? And so you, you, it's a little more time consuming, but yet it'll get you the answer if you're not certain how to set up the problem or set the relationships, okay? So when you have those numerical answer choices, just think about using those as opposed to the traditional math, okay? All right, writing and language arts. Let's talk about that here. This is the, the second section on the SAT. It's the first section on the ACT. The, the ACT calls it English. That's what they call it, their English section. The ACT section is five passages, 15 questions each, 45 minutes. Very almost leisurely pace. That nine minutes per passage coming through there, you can get all those questions answered, okay? Same thing here, you're, you're doing a little bit faster, 35 minute section with about 40 questions and you're moving a little bit more pace, but the, they're testing the same things, right? They're testing just basic fundamental grammar rules, right? Subject verb agreement, correct usage of a pronoun and gender and number. Um, fragments, run-ons, correct punctuation. Uh, different things that those stills. A big one that probably most students need to work on, most of my students run into are the idioms, right? Those specific relationship phrases that are um, mandatory in English grammar. You, you just got to memorize them, right? Um, the, the, uh, we'll say something like, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the problem is on the screen, right? On is a preposition. It's on the screen, right? I am standing at the desk. You see a different preposition that I use there, right? Some of the popular ones is, you've seen that all the time, but they do not only but also, right? If you have a not only, you got to have a but also. All those idioms that your English teachers have driven into you since, since middle school for sure that you've got to be responsible for. But it also goes beyond that. It's not just mechanics of writing, it's the logic of writing. Can you recognize when sentences are out of order? Can you recognize when, a, when a, an author should or should not put in another sentence and why? Right? You're going to get questions that say, the author is considering adding this sentence at the end of paragraph four. And then you're going to get four answer choices. And it's two of them will be yes, and two of them will be no, and they'll each have separate reasons for that. Okay, you see, it's ratcheting up the, the rigor a little bit in terms of being able to analyze the relevance of that particular sentence, should it go there, what it does or does not do to the particular essay. Okay? So what we look for is we go through and some of the things we test here. Let's look at question nine, right? Although biotechnology companies and the chronically naive imagine that there is no danger to be free from fear. Would they, would they imagine, right? What's the clue in that sentence there, right? Think about, there's, there's three fundamental sentence structures on, this, on these tests, on this writing, right? One we call definition or continuity or amplification, right? That idea of one sentence kind of continues or amplifies or defines the other part. The second and very popular one is the contrast like we have here, although Right? Contrast, that kind of going opposites. And then the third is what we call cause and effect. That one part of the sentence brings about, produces, results in, is the motivation for the other part of the sentence. Okay? And so what we look for here is clues. We read enough, right? We read enough to, to uh, see what's going on and be able to answer the question. A lot of it's right between our ears, right? It just doesn't sound right. It just doesn't sound right. And so what we look for is to make, if it needs to be fixed, to find the right fix. If you notice in question nine, first answer choice, and that's in a lot of them, no change. Correct is written. Well, I got four answer choices. One of them's no change. It's gonna pop up sometimes. I don't wanna overcorrect. And the other ones, if I think it's broken, what I need to do is there's three kind of guiding themes here that get us to the correct point, right? Certainly the fix that I pick whichever answer choice I pick, has to be correct. Secondly, they are strongly in favor of what we call concise, concision, right? The ability to write directly and using the fewest words, right? Avoiding the passive voice, avoiding redundancy, avoiding flowery language or self-references, right? So it's gotta be concise. And third, the idea is relevance. What do you think I mean by relevance? Relevance is that idea that in making that correction, I don't change what the author was trying to say. The author had a point to make in that sentence, wanted to convey an idea, did it poorly, I'm fixing it for him or her, that's all. I'm not changing, putting new words into their mouth. I'm not changing the meaning of the sentence, okay? In a method, right, read enough, 
and to identify the issue, interpret any in infographics. What we mean by infographics is sometimes in the, in the writing, they'll give us, they won't even mention it in the passage, and they'll give us a little chart or a pie chart or a data table or some kind of representation. We just interpret that like we do in the science or in the math, right? Next, we're going to look at being able to find the, the best fix for that, right? Eliminate and choices that don't address the issue that's broken, and then don't be lazy, right? Why, why risk your, your college admission on being lazy or just on impulse or gut, right? Read it back in, right? Find the one and make sure it fits back in from, because you can only change the underlying portion. The fix that whatever answer choice you pick to go in there has to fit in perfectly with the other parts of the sentence that are not underlined. And so we're looking again, and there's those buzzwords I used, right? Correct, concise, and relevant. So let's look at this question here, right? Potential problems range from the relatively minor, increased possibilities of allergic reactions to certain foods, for instance, to the potentially devastating, the complete skewing of the balance of an ecosystem. All of these factors should be carefully considered before we choose to risk so much for the possibility of a better tomato. Okay, now we're just taking a snippet of this passage. It would be a much more protracted context here about are we, what are we doing to get a better tomato. What kind of word is that that's underlined? One single word underlined, we, a pronoun, right? On these tests, our pronouns have to relate back specifically to a noun a subject of some sort, right? I gotta find that in the sentence or preceding sentence, right? And when there's a pronoun that's underlined like this, the idea here is ambiguity. Does it really relate back? Who is the we? All right, are you and I involved in that ecosystem disruption for the new tomato? Don't think so, right? But somebody's acting on our behalf, right? And so we look at the way to fix that is to make it more specific, right? We as a society, that's the we. There's where the author's talking about. We as a society must carefully consider these risks, right? Those of us who comprise society. Now what's wrong with that? Didn't B just say the same thing a lot shorter, con concisely? Yeah. And then the other one, the citizens making up our population, that's really twisted and turned around, right? We as a society does two things concisely identifies who is making the decisions and it takes it out, makes it le not ambiguous. It really defines it for us. So, so our correct choice there would be, would be B, all right? And so there's the, uh, you know, just reading enough and understanding and practicing the types of things and the clues that they give us, right? For, for what words are underlined and how to fix those. Let's look at another one here. For example, continuing on in this story here, the cultivation of insect resistant plants could lead to the reduction or even destruction of certain insect species that naturally feed on these plants. A change in the insect population could have a disastrous impact on certain bird species, period. They rely on the affected insects as their food source, period. Okay, then I get to also. So I've read enough, I think. Question 12, all right, not asking me to fix a word, it says which choice most effectively combines the sentences at the underlying portion, okay? Well, right now they're separated by a period and then very shortly and, and indefinitely it picks up with they rely on the affected insects as their food source, right? Well, let's put it together is could have a disastrous impact on certain bird species. Let me pause right here and talk about a, I haven't talked about this before, but I just want to, I want to put this out here in terms of what I've seen over my years of test taking and teaching people to take tests. It's what I call the power of predicting, right? These guys who write this test, they're good. Any of the tests, the standardized tests that are out there, they're good. They know what they're doing. They, they craft a, a question. They get a right answer that is beyond reproach. They don't want to have any arguments with anybody about a correct answer choice. And then they create wrong answer traps that can distract you. That can maybe be the opposite if you're not paying attention or distort something, all right? And so what you want to do as a test taker is jump ahead of those guys, right? When you read enough, you analyze it, make a prediction in your head. What's that got to look like? What's got to fix that? I need to get that period out of there and just kind of bring those two ideas together in a nice, concise way, okay? And then you hold on to that prediction. See, here's, here's most standardized test takers. You tell me, tell you what they do. Maybe you do this too, right? You read the problem. Yeah, I think I know what that means. You read the question. Okay, I think I know what that means. And immediately, immediately you jump down to choice A. 
and you say, A, I don't think it's A. B, oh, I like B. B sounds right. C, I don't know what C means. D, D sounds a lot like B. It's got to be one of those two, right? See, if, if you're coming down to a coin toss every time on a standardized test, something's going wrong, right? What I want to do is predict, hold on to that prediction. It's not A, it's not B, it's not C, it's D. And I have, debate is over, okay? It matches my prediction. It fixes what I need to have it fix, okay? So predict, predict, predict before you go down to the answer choices. See, the test writers know that most of us, including me, most of us as human beings are fundamentally a little bit lazy, right? We want the answer choices to kind of flesh that out for us. You are more successful by predicting and evaluating, not comparing the choices one against the other, but evaluating them against your research-based prediction. That's where you want to be. That is where you're a strong test taker. No other factor, I think, that separates mediocrity and excellence in test taking is that power to predict. And so I'm going to do it on every part of the test that I can do that in, okay? Let's look at our choices. We want to bring that together. Certain bird species, what? All we know is what? They rely on the insects, right? Look at choice B. Certain bird species that rely on the affected insects as their food source. Read it back in, and that one works, right? Yeah, I need the change. I don't want to have that, that hard fragment sentence at the end, right? Certain bird species relying on the affected insects. No. Certain bird species and they, no, that totally breaks it up. Totally breaks it up, right? So choice B there. And then down to the final one here, right? Is it a will or a could? Let's see what it is, right? An ecosystem is a delicate thing, and the ripple created by genetically altering one variety of soybean will translate. We don't know that, right? The author's tone has never been certainty. The author's tone has been the potential of something happening that we don't know about, right? It could be very minor. It could be very major, it's said in the preceding paragraph. And so it could, not will, right? There's the right word choice. There's the right word choice. And let's look at some reading here on these tests. They're very similar now in terms of the passages um, and, and the, the way they present information and what's expected of you, okay? Um, you, can, you can get a, um, um, a variety of passages, but they're all pretty much going to be in the same order. As I said, on the, on the ACT, you're going to get that literary fiction, you're going to get the social sciences, get the humanities, and get the natural sciences. Here on the SAT, you get one of the fiction, and then two in the social studies or sciences. One of those might be paired, a paired passage, and two in the natural sciences. Two, one of those might be paired passages. What I'm saying is paired passages, two shorter passages that together are as long as one, and they are, aren't like guys sitting in opposite corners writing against each other. They have overlapping scopes, we call it. They, they speak generally about the same things. They agree on some things, and they disagree on some things. And that's where you, as a test taker, have to take charge. Where, where are those elements of agreement? Where are those elements of disagreement? How are they going to respond to each other? Okay. And so what we do here, and again, as I said earlier, is it is never about learning something new. It's not about the what. You need to know about the what for the topic and things, what's going on, but it's all about two big questions here, okay? What we call why, why is it this author's writing, and how, how is the author accomplishing his or her purpose, okay? Now, if, to get to the why, just think about all the reasons you've been asked to write papers in school. What are some of those reasons you've been asked to write, right? To persuade, to refute, to compare and contrast, to simply describe and explain or an expository type writing or research investigation, right? Same thing here on this test. The authors are doing the same thing, okay? Let's look at what we've got here in, in terms of a method is looking for four things. The topic, the scope, the purpose, and the main idea. A couple things to remember as you read here. This is big picture reading. You got to get down to that big main idea and why the author's writing, how is it put together. Nobody comes and takes your passage away from you. It's not a closed book test, right? You always have its referent reading. And so what you want to do is know where things are without having to memorize all the details down the page, all right? So what do I mean by these terms? Topic, scope, purpose, main idea. Let me give you an example. Let's say I want to write a paper about the Amazon River Basin. All right. As old as I am, I can spend the rest of my life writing about the Amazon River Basin, right? And so there's my big topic. Now the scope 
The scope is that idea of, hey, I can't write about everything in one sitting. I got to take some aspect or perspective of that big topic and kind of funnel down, right? Take the big topic, Amazon River Basin, and come down to some narrow aspect to write about. So I might choose to write about the impact of fertilizer runoff from increased agriculture, right? Doing a lot more farming in the Amazon River Basin. It's hitting the rivers. What's it doing, the fertilizer that's coming off of there? Okay, so there's my scope. Now my purpose could be anything. Could be simply to describe, could be to, to, to show what's, what's being done or not being done, to argue in one way or the other. Say I wanted to argue, my point was to say, hey, there's no negative impact from fertilizer runoff. So that's my purpose, is to argue that or to show that, and that's what becomes easy, right? The main idea is simply the answer to that purpose question, right? My main idea, hey, guess what? There's no negative impact from fertilizer runoff, you see? That's what we're after, to get our hands around this passage quickly and efficiently, right? We don't have all, we don't have two weeks to read this passage, right? It's not like an assignment in English class, you come back next week and have it done. You gotta do it in a few minutes right here. Okay, because it's not just the reading, 400, 500, 600 words, it's 10, 11 questions that are following after that, okay? So there's the why, topic, scope, purpose, main idea. The how goes to what we call understanding the keywords, when the author is doing something, and the passage map. What are the functions of the paragraph? See, the SAT and the ACT, the people that write these tests are like all standardized test writers, right? They, they believe the building blocks, the key building blocks of a passage are its paragraphs, and that the author has thought well enough ahead to plan out and give each paragraph a function, right? And so my passage map isn't regurgitating what the author said, it's understanding the function of that paragraph. How does it fit in vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the passage, okay? And the keywords can help me there. Very important keywords, we've talked about a couple of them already. Contrast, right? Although, however, rather, yet, yeah? The author is contesting something. That's important. The author's in action, right? Continuity. Maybe the author is saying, in addition, furthermore, moreover, also, right? Building that case, building that evidence, right? The author's in action, right? Evident words of sequence, right? Certainly in a lot of our reading and understanding of things, it changes over time. Either our knowledge of some phenomena or our theories about that phenomena change over time. The sequence. So we can make deductions about that. What's changed, okay? Illustrations. That's a big one. We are always going to be asked about the examples, surveys, experiments, any kind of evidence that the authors bring into the passage. How is that functioning? How is the author using information, right? Again, not so much what it says, but how is it being used, okay? So we look at those things, and then probably the most important of the keywords is what we call the tone and emphasis and point of view words, right? When that author's voice kind of cracks through the objective facts and really kind of colors or evaluates what he or she's talking about, right? And this, is, this almost gets easy sometimes, right? As easy as the L-Y words, the adverbs, right? If I talked to you about something that happened to me today and I said, sadly or unfortunately, you'd have some good context that this wasn't a good experience for me, right? But if I change, simply change those L-Y words to significantly or happily, see how it changes? My whole tone, my whole point of view changes right there in that one word change. And so those are the things we look for as clues to tell us what is this author after? What's this author trying to accomplish? Okay, so let's read through a couple of this here. We'll see we've got a passage that um, it's going to be part of a, a paired passage. We're just going to look at a snippet of it here. That starts off talking about coffee, all right? So let's look at that. Coffee is a pillar of the world economy, generating both jobs and profits. The plant produced in revenue to the tune of $15.4 billion in 2013 alone. Coffee industry is also one of the world's largest employers, supporting 26 million employers. Because, what kind of word is because? Evidence word, right? Causation word. Because of the global importance of coffee, scientists at the University of Buffalo and their international colleagues were compelled, compelled to sequence the genome of the most popular coffee plant. In the genome lies the secrets of the bold flavor the people around the world have come to enjoy daily, as well as the caffeine kick that comes along with it. This new genetic information can be used to expand the market by creating new types of coffee varieties. The results of the study can also, continuity, also safeguard the existing industry. Scientists can now modify the genetic material of the coffee plant. Hardier strains of popular coffee types can be created out of, so that they are resistant to drought, disease, and bugs, all right? What we know, what's, what's our topic here? What's that first word? Coffee, right? There's the topic, right? Let's keep reading down. We see what I noted that because, right? Something's going on, cause and effect. We get to the scope. What part of, of this thing are we talking about, coffee? The genome, 
right? See, it's not hiding from us. It's right in the text. There's my scope. I'm not talking about all the different types of beans. I'm talking about the genetic makeup of the beans that they are now going to study. We've got specific individuals that are going to study. And not only did they choose to study it, hey, I'm kind of bored. Let's go find something else to study. It was what? They were compelled to study. And it's all about what? Huge market, right? Coffee is a huge, huge market, and they're looking at ways to, to get to that market, right? This new genetic information can be used to expand the market by creating new types of coffee varieties, right? There it is, right? I'm really getting to the core of what they're after, right? Is this any difference than that little science passage we read a little while ago about new PVC? Aren't they just looking at, we're just reading about some similar things, they're exploring things, right? Yeah, you see? You're doing the same thing across the whole test. It's not that I, I'm really good at math and I I'm really am terrible at reading in English. It's not that I, I don't like science and I'm not ever going to study it versus, hey, I'm, I like to read more literature. It's all about critical thinking. It's all about critical reasoning, right? Most of you are probably going to have anywhere from, from six to ten jobs in your life in different fields, right? It's those transferable skills, that critical thinking that colleges are hungry for, that they want to train the new thinkers, the new problem solvers in any field. That's what these tests are about. Yeah, it's a gatekeeper. Yeah, nobody likes them. Nobody likes taking tests. But that, if you're going to be serious about your application, and if you want to even seek those rewards of financial assistance through scholarships, you got to get ready for these tests, okay? So we're doing the same thing. Let's look at this next paragraph, see where this thing goes, is now we're doing what? We've kind of come through, and the researchers start to describe what the researchers did, right? So I can sort of pick up my, my pacing a little bit. I know what's going on in this paragraph. They began their work by doing this. The conclusions drawn will help save money and resources during the coffee production process. They were able to isolate this information that does with the caffeine, and they can help people avoid caffeine. Yeah, you see here that they did this, yeah, it's, this would remove a costly step. The outcomes, right? The outcomes of, this is, that's the function of this second paragraph, right? First paragraph, this is what they studied and why. Secondly, this is the outcome of their study. You see? I could, I could do this about coffee. I could do this about anything. Think about astronomy or something, some metals and engineering or uh, some, some economic statistics or social science statistics about populations. You could, same thing here, right? Phenomena, how we studied it, what were our results? You could do that anywhere. Very, very common structure, okay? All right, so let's get to a couple questions here and just get a feel for this. There's a variety of questions, and one thing that as you practice on these tests, question identification is critical. It gives you that, it gives you that, um, that critical thinking demand that's on you right now, okay, by identifying the question. Okay. Question 32, which of the following best describes the central idea? The central idea. There's the main idea, the big conclusion, right? This is certainly predictable, right? What would your prediction be? They talked about coffee, and they studied the genome in order to what? Expand the market, grow it, be able to make it much more profitable and a, and a global market for this, these products. Okay. So let's look at the clues in this question and see that we got it's a main idea question. And we predict, and there it is, right? There's the match of our prediction. A doesn't do it. Advancement in genome sequencing will lead, no. Genome sequencing of coffee can increase probability of coffee as, there it's all about, right? Right? This, this kind of question is almost like if you were writing the little book review for this and you, you start stripping away everything, what's the last sentence the author would give up? Right? That's the point. This is what, this is on the book jacket, right? This is the synopsis, okay? Now, question 34. That word that I need to identify there is suggest, right? See, suggest sounds like it's getting kind of loosey-goosey, right? Like it's your opinion or my opinion or what we might think. Suggest on this test and on the ACT both is the language of inference. That which must be true, all right? That which must be true. And so we're looking for what must be true based on the information in the passage, even though it's not expressly stated. You do this all the time in your, in your history and your and your uh, language and, and English classes, right? So it, we don't have a real good strong clue, but let's analyze them, right? Coffee industry will fail without new developments? No, that's extreme. And that's one answer choice that we want to watch out for, right? Stay away from only, always, never, impossible, will, right? We don't know that at all. B, newly developed varieties of coffee plants are more expensive for, cons no, we don't know that, right? See that language in that choice about comparison, right? They are more expensive for consumers than our existing varieties. 
Most times a comparison like that is what we call an irrelevant comparison. They're trying to get your eyes off the prize, get your eyes off the essay. Okay? Choice C, future research will lead to developments that could increase the profitability for coffee producers. Well, there's paragraph two, right? Didn't we see something in paragraph two about the idea that it's going to expand the market, get rid of those harmful effects, and have people and make it much cheaper to get the decaffeinated? There it is, right? That must be true. Now, here's the new question on the SAT. This is brand new since March of 2016, where that very next question after hits, if we read that there, it says, which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? What they call command of evidence questions, right? Not only do you have to get this question right, the one in 34 there, but you gotta get, you gotta get the source in the text for that. You gotta support it. Now, the other side of that, say I'm totally lost on question 34. If I see question 35, I got places I can go look for it, right? right? I can take those text chunks and go see if it's there, right? And we found this in paragraph two, and they talked about these new developments will help take away the bad health effects and make more people able to do it, and that's gonna be there at the end there, lines 28 to 33, remove the ill health effects of of the, uh, of, the, of the parts of the coffee that are bad for people and now more people can enjoy it. All right, so there's a brief overview. This, don't take this presentation at all as the, your one-stop one shop for preparation, right? What you need to do is start committing yourself to a schedule, just like if you had a part-time job, right? All my students, they can't come to tutoring, they can't do this, they have to go somewhere because they got a part-time job. You got to make SAT or ACT prep a part-time job, right? And there's two good, good ways to do that. Um, that are free, totally free. Um, one is you go to the Khan Academy. Many of my students are using Khan Academy to review math. The Khan Academy has, this is an official formal relationship between the college board SAT people who write this test and the Khan Academy people for resources. You register, you can take quizzes and workshops and, and watch videos, instructional videos, guided practice. You can perform, you get feedback on your performance Right? Where are your strengths? Where are your challenge areas still? What do you need to do? Suggested suggestions for additional practice, right? So Khan Academy and registering there, and you can cross over your registration with Khan Academy, <coughs> excuse me, and the SAT, okay? The second resource up here is the Daily Practice app. Right on your phone, you can download a Daily Practice app. It gives you a daily question, right? They have seven full-length practice tests that they've developed. Now, more coming out later this year, right, that you can take a full-length practice test, you download the test, print it off, you get the answer grid, you take the test under timed conditions. There's really, you know, if you're gonna take a full-length test, take it under timed conditions. Don't, don't lie to yourself. Well, you know, I'll try to save time next time. You gotta live with that time. You're not gonna get any more time. But then you can take a picture of it and submit it on that app and get a score immediately. If this had been your actual SAT, what would you have scored? What, would you have gotten 540 in math? Would you have gotten a 600 in English and language arts? And and, and so you have that capability, and again, it builds your progress, right? It can tell what you've done in the past, keeps records, makes suggestions for you. So those two resources, right, Khan Academy and the Daily Practice app are just essential to you. And then two other resources there that are both for students and for parents is just through the, the National Association of College Admissions Counselors, where they have some free brochures for you to understand this process of college admission, the importance of the test, the importance of much other things, like your GPA, like the course load, that the types of courses that you've taken and the rigor of that that you've taken. Have you made advantage of, of, of any uh, you know, AP or, or honors courses? You know? So the, if, you, if you look at those resources there, you can see the, the, uh, the National Academy has those things there for both parents and for students. I also do a lot of uh, informational stuff about financial aid as well, because that is an important piece of this pie, is being able to afford this process called college. Okay, so I hope this has been informative for you, and get, get to practice, get with Khan Academy, get with SAT, get with your guidance counselors, get ready for this, look for opportunities throughout the Suffolk school system or elsewhere where we'll be having these workshops and practice tests to get you ready to go to college and be successful uh, as, you, as you take that journey. Thank you.